special edition of PFT PM. Miles Simmons, he thought he was done with me until next Monday. But the NFL never sleeps. You never know where the next big story is coming from. And I will confess, and I'm not trying to claim any credit here. I just had a weird feeling. And I wish I had tweeted it. But I just had a feeling something was going to go down today. I didn't know what, and it did go down. Mm -hmm. Colts coach Frank Reich fired. Just eight days after Jim Ursay, the owner of the team, told Chris Mortensen of ESPN that Ursay not even thinking about it, firmly behind Frank Reich. Now Reich out the door. Miles, what was your first reaction when you heard it? Well, I mean, you were you're saying that you know you had a feeling something was going to happen today. I was the one on our previous show who said that there started to feel like a little bit of an air of inevitability, and you pushed back on that. So well, I did. Not that I I'm taking I took a victory lap, his but word. yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> How many times sure. do we have to hear billionaires <laughs> talk before we realize that we really shouldn't take them at their word? So, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say this. You know, I read a lot of stuff out of Indianapolis because – I, I don't have any real connection to them, but I love their beat writing core. They got a really great slate of beat writers from, you know, guys in the athletic to ESPN to the Indianapolis star. And the way that they were writing about how Frank Reich sounded yesterday after that loss, and you go over 14 on third down, you go over two on fourth down and the, the offensive performance is as ugly as it was. That's where I started to get the sense that even Frank Reich was kind of like, ah, man, I, I'm out of answers. And, you know, he didn't say that, you know, he said in his press conference, which I was just going back and watching that, you know, I feel like there's always a solution out there. But apparently the solution that Jim Irsay came up with was to say goodbye to Frank Reich today. And look, if I would have guessed at any move like this today, I would have said the Raiders – parting ways with Josh McDaniels because it would just food. It would fit with the whole Mark Davis vibe. I, I didn't expect it. And one reason, and, and look, by the time you folks are listening to this or watching it or both, and thank you, if you are, there'll probably be an interim coach named and greater clarity as to who the offensive coordinator will be. Cause that's the big issue. Mm -hmm. Who's going to run the offense. They just fired offensive coordinator, Marcus Brady, Last week, now Reich is out. He's an offensive guy who's taken over the offense. And you've got Gus Bradley, who could become the interim head coach. You've got John Fox lurking on that staff. He could take the keys. He's done some good things with a couple of teams in the past. I, but this is nothing other than dog paddling until the end of the season. And then Jim Irsay goes out and tries to make some big move. But it really is stunning to me that they would put themselves in this spot. Because what are they really trying to do? Are they trying to turn this season around? Could he actually go outside of the organization for an interim head coach? I wouldn't put anything past Jim Irsay at this point. Now that we have seen this urgency manifest itself in firing Frank Reich, when the team is three, five, and one, and by no means done yet. Well, it's interesting, Mike, because it's been three weeks in a row of something pretty seismic, let's call it, from the Indianapolis Colts. I mean, first you get the benching of Matt Ryan for Sam Ellinger. And, you know, I mean, that almost worked against the Washington Commanders. And it's interesting because I think it was, I was talking about this with Peter King on his podcast where Frank Reich has said before, you know, you give me a week with a quarterback, I can get him to win probably one game, right? But it's when you get that quarterback and there's film on him and it's this and it's that, it, you know, that's when things start changing. So then last week, you know, they lose that game. Then they fire Marcus Brady as the offensive coordinator. And then you go into Sunday and you see the effects of, yeah, you might be able to get Sam Ellinger in position to win one game, but Lordy, when you go to Bill Belichick and you're facing that defense in Foxborough, and it's one of his first starts of his career, even if he is a second year QB, that's going to be a much, much more difficult proposition. And it obviously did not work out, right? And so now you get this third straight Monday of something fairly seismic, and it happens to be Frank Reich getting his walking papers. And yeah, it's, I don't know what you do offensively. That's kind of why it's maybe a little more surprising that even if they had that sense of inevitability that this was going to come to an end, the fact that it comes to an end in the middle of the season where there is just no clarity on what this offense is going to be. I mean, it's not like Marcus Brady was calling plays before anyway. Right? I mean, he was heavily involved in the game plan stuff, and that's what an OC who doesn't call plays does. 
But if you get rid of Frank Reich now and he's still there, then it's like, okay, there's at least some sort of natural succession. Now there isn't. And, you know, it's like you've set up the team to kind of run around like a chicken with its head cut off for the rest of the season, half the season, really, until you get to the January and then finally you can really hire somebody. It's it's a really interesting process that's going to come here from the Indianapolis Colts. And maybe this is how you get your charter membership in Tank Club. You don't try to do it. You don't tell the world you're doing it. You just create a situation where the team is in complete disarray. Nature takes its course. You go 3-13-1, and and you have one of the top picks, and you go out and hire a great head coach and draft a quarterback who fits in this succession of Peyton Manning to Andrew Luck to whoever they – They fall into next, if that even happens. This is just a complete and total mess. And will a new coach have freedom to undo the decision to bench Matt Ryan? Probably not, because you got $17 million riding on the ability of Matt Ryan to pass a physical next March. That's when injury guarantees will be vested. And if he can't pass a physical, they get vested because he can't be cut while he's injured. So they have a problem. And that was an Ursa decision. It was clear when Reich was explaining it to reporters, that was an Ursay decision. And this is an Ursay decision. I thought Ursay was going to fire Reich after the loss to the Jaguars week 18 of last year because it was Carson Wentz failing. Reich was the Wentz guy, and Reich's got to go. And I think Chris Ballard talked him out of it. That's the next step, I wonder, because oh, yeah. in the same breath that Jim Ursay gave Frank Reich, the clear and emphatic, that's how Mort characterized it, rather emphatically, He's not thinking about firing Frank Reich or Chris Ballard. Is that what we're talking about next Monday? I mean, it certainly could be, but I I guess you need at least some sort of stability in order to get you through the rest of the season, you know, until you can get into the off season. But I I think that just because Frank Reich, you know, is gone and Chris Ballard is not today does not mean that Ballard won't be eventually, right? I mean, at some point you have to look at who has put that roster together. And that roster is not necessarily one that has a lot of playmakers offensively, right? You think of Jonathan Taylor and yes, he's been a great running back and he led the league in rushing last year, but where did that get them? You know? And yeah, some of that comes on to, to Carson Wentz, but like, I don't know. I mean, you have Michael Pittman, who is a really good receiver, but who else do we really talk about from that Colts offense that you say, yes, that is absolutely somebody that you can look at and they are a go-to guy. I mean, I I don't know. And I think a lot of that will definitely fall on Chris Ballard, as will the fact that that offensive line, despite how highly paid it is, is playing like dog water. That that is a really, really highly paid offensive line, and the performance that they're giving right now is atrocious. I mean, you can say that all sacks are not on an offensive line, and I actually kind of believe that. I do believe that. I don't just kind of believe it. But anytime somebody's getting sacked nine times, as Ellinger was on Sunday, there's an offensive line component to that, right? There's an offensive line component to the fact that Matt Ryan looks so, so bad in the games that he started too. So obviously pinching Matt Ryan was not the only thing that was wrong or the only problem that could have had some sort of solution for the Colts. But I I don't know that, you know, you can just sit here and say, yeah, Chris Ballard should keep his job just going into it. You know, even though that Frank Reich is gone now, I, I don't know. The sacks remind me of what, former Colts quarterback Peyton Manning once said after a playoff loss, I'm trying to be a good teammate here, but let's just say there were some problems with protection. There are many problems with protection, problems all over the place. I'm going to weave in some questions that we asked for via Twitter, PFTPM Posse. He says, ultimately, who do you think is responsible for the bad performance? I have an idea. I want to hear yours first. Uh, between um, anyone, Ballard, anyone. Reich, throw, throw a dart, anyone. Well, I mean, you, where does the buck stop, right? It, it's kind of Ursay. It, it always has to do with the owner, but the owner, I mean, is the one that's going to say, all right, well, we have to hire people and you can't fire the owner. So, I mean, it, Chris Ballard and Frank Reich are, are a pretty good tandem. You know, they've been doing this together for a while. And I guess, you know, the other person that you could maybe bring into this conversation is Andrew Luck, right? That's who I was going to mention. Not that it's his fault, 
Right. But that was the, the the first domino. I love that metaphor of the dominoes falling and you got to flick the first one to get it going. That was the first domino that's led to all the shit that they've, sorry, that they've dealt with over the past few years. He had every right to retire. He and did. I say all the time, if a guy's not all in, he should not be playing. Absolutely. If he wanted not. to go, yes. then go. Yeah. But that was the, the thing that got this ball rolling in Indianapolis. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly was. And I mean, I, I was covering the Raiders at the time, um, and I just remember how seismic that was, not just from you know, the Colts standpoint, but from everybody in the league that's watching it. And you get John Gruden talking about how, yeah, I mean, Andrew Luck's a great quarterback, and it's just kind of one of these wild things to see when somebody who's ostensibly in the prime of their career retires. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of where it starts. But then, I mean, you could also say that they didn't expect Philip rivers necessarily to retire after the one year that he was there and he got them to the postseason, And then that made them in turn, go and get Carson Wentz. And then Carson Wentz didn't work out. And so that in turn makes them go and get Matt Ryan and Matt Ryan doesn't work out. And it's just been one thing after another. So yeah, I mean, Andrew luck, if you look at it that way, was certainly the first domino to fall. I just had a thought, and I'm, I've got to tweet it in real time while we're taping this. Oh, how fun is that? Oh, it's so much fun. Um, and it's even more fun to have a thought because I rarely have them these days. What if Ursay hires John Gruden, either now or after the season? Wouldn't he be the guy to do it? Wouldn't he be? Think about it. He's currently in this mode of sticking his finger in Daniel Snyder's eye. He's sticking his finger in the league's eye because of this notion. And he hasn't come out and said it, but he's come close. The idea that they covered up the Beth Wilkinson investigation results, and he doesn't want that to happen again with Mary Jo White. And he's feeling his oats. He's pushing out, or at least he's somehow responsible for the apparent pushing out of Daniel Snyder. I could see him do it. I really could. We got a question coming up about Sean Payton, but it just occurred to me. It wouldn't be crazy if Ursay does it because – the sane among us have to predict the potential decisions of those. And I'm not going to say he's not sane. He's just, what's the word I'm looking he's for? He's unpredictable. Erratic, unpredictable, unconventional. Yeah, would unconventional it stun it? you if he would make a move like that, either after the season or hire him right now to come in and take over? Well, yeah, because of all the things that John Gruden lost his job for. I know, I, mean, this I is know. Not I and, understand. And, you know, if 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 uh, Eric Erse is going to start preaching about, you know, we should do what's right and we have to stand for what's right and all that, then what the hell would that look like if you go hire John Gruden, who lost his job for racism and sexism and homophobia, et cetera, et cetera? I don't think that that kind of jibes with what he's been talking about. I, like, he's Brian on, he's Flores, on if you want, if you want to talk about needling the league, then Brian Flores would be the one that would make more sense to me in you Great know in point. terms of what the off season is. Great point. Right? Obviously you can't do that right now because Brian Flores has a job and he's not just sitting on his couch somewhere. So, you know, I, well, I, I see where you're going with the John Gruden again, thing, but I think that, all, that's these are all, what he's been saying. These are all rational thoughts. We have to project the behavior of someone who is shown to be irrational. As evidenced by the fact that he fired his coach today when he has no one to take over the offense. That's the thing. Like, how do you even begin to understand <laughs> what Jim Irsay is going to do when nothing he does can even begin to be comprehended? Um, another thing about this, too, it goes back to Josh McDaniels. And look, they they had McDaniels. McDaniels jilted them after the Patriots lost to the Eagles. Super Bowl 52, he decided to stay put. They hire Frank Reich then. There is a certain poetry or symmetry or something at tree that applies here when you consider Reich got the job after beating Bill Belichick, lost the job after losing to Belichick and mustering only three points, a far cry yeah. from what he did with Nick Foles. And I, I wonder how hard he was lobbying behind the scenes to get Foles on the field. And let Foles That's a good question. show what he can do. That's the other guy they have a quarterback. They don't have to bring Matt Ryan back out of the glue factory. They can give Nick Foles a shot. Well, that's the funny part too, right? I mean, who knows if he really felt like they had to make a change, then why not go to somebody like Nick Foles? And then maybe perhaps you have the owner saying, well, 
won't someone just play the young quarterback that we have so that we see what we have, you know, instead of saying the more logical thing, which is, okay, if we're going to get rid of the guy that we have, that's the veteran. Why don't we just go to another veteran? Because the veteran ostensibly gives us the better chance to win. And to add to the sort of symmetry, poetry, whatever you want to call it, not just, it's not just that, you know, he gets fired after losing to Bill Belichick gets fired the week before he's got to go play Josh McDaniels in Las Vegas. That's the Colts' first opponent for whoever the new interim coach is going to be. And this is one of those games where you might see that interim coach lift, you know, where they get that, oh, man, you know, we got to rally around each other. We've got to play for this new guy. We got to show that we still care and that we want our jobs and all these different types of things. Because there's some bad stuff that's going on in Las Vegas. I don't know what the hell is going on there. But, you know, maybe it was sort of a blessing in disguise that they, Josh McDaniels left them at the altar And that they got, you know, some good years out of Frank Reich. I I think that Frank Reich is a good football coach. I I do. I just think that at this point, you know, when there's no quarterback stability, when the offense can't do anything, and, you know, we talk about messages maybe getting a little stale, that might have happened as well, especially when you see that the offense is completely ineffective. This is the kind of thing that ends up happening. The Colts had the Bills on the ropes with Phillip Rivers at the helm in the 2020 postseason but rivers was ready to retire i don't know whether he wanted to stay or not there's some some fuzzy versions of the events as to whether or not the colts wanted him back but obviously it hasn't worked and as to mcdaniels i was on cbs sports radio with bill Ryder earlier this morning and i pointed out that mcdaniels may be the latest in this line of norv turner wade phillips great coordinators who can't get it done as coaches go back to being coordinators do a really good job and then fool someone into thinking they're head coaching material. It may just be Josh McDaniels Mm. is a really, really good offensive coordinator. So uh, yeah, but you're right. Having the Colts come to town with this interim coach bump could be bad news for the Raiders at a time when they're just trying to win a game question from Neil watches PFT. Is this the right move for the Colts? They basically folded in the tents after starting three, three and one and beat the chiefs. Did Ursay pull the plug on the season too quickly? Or was this an aftershock of last year's collapse? Here's what I'm trying to figure out. Are they tanking or is this Ursay desperate to squeeze something positive out of the season i think we'll know if he does try to do something really kooky and hire somebody outside the organization to come in and take over if he tries to hire john gruden sean payton whoever to come in and take over then that means it's really not as i said earlier today settling into the hot bath of failure and accepting and hoping you get that high draft pick it's ursay thinking he can actually turn this thing around Well, and that's going to be the interesting thing to see what he says about the decision and, you know, the decisions that have happened really over the course of the last three weeks. And we talked about it, right? Whether it's going from Ryan Dellinger, firing Marcus Brady, and then now firing Frank Reich. But what was the level of influence that Jim Ursay had on that process. And I mean, it's been pretty clear. And again, Frank Reich didn't come out and say it, but it's very clear that he, M. Ursay, has been really involved in the conversations, at least, around what it is that the Colts are going to do on the field. And that some of that may stem from the fact that they got so soundly beaten you know, by the Jacksonville Jaguars last year. I, I think that that's... If, if I'm Jim Ursay, and I just know it as a person who covers the NFL, right? That loss that they had last year to the Jags, in Jacksonville, when all they need to do is win the game and they make it to the postseason, that sticks in your mind. It sticks in my mind that the fact that they lost the week before to the Las Vegas Raiders, right? I mean, all they needed to do was win a game and they would have gotten themselves in there. And and that would stick in my craw a lot, despite the fact that you got rid of Carson Wentz, who, you know, they seem to be the scapegoat of everything. And you bring in somebody else. And then it's like, well, guess that wasn't really the only problem. That meshes with the question we have from Paul PJ5. People love that Ursay called out Snyder, but is Ursay an owner that is also too involved and part of the problem? This is that continuum of how involved an owner is. And look, from time to time, I make the point about the Packers. They don't have an owner, which keeps them from doing things maybe they should do. It also 
helps them avoid having someone who comes in and screws everything up. And I think back to those videos we saw from Ursay after they lost, standing outside his private jet with the jet engine still running, and you can barely hear what he's saying. I don't think it was the jet engine on his plane, but it's just general plane noise. Or sitting inside the private jet, very relatable scene for a video. And, and it's clear that he's sick of what's gone on, he's had enough, and he's taking over. And he's got every right to do it. He he holds the pink slip to the franchise. But whatever he's doing, it's creating a sense of wild desperation. It's not working. Other than the fact that they are 3-5-1. and one. But they're 3-5-1 and one despite all of this craziness. And the question is, what's the end game here? Is it tank or is it try to swim some way, somehow, even as they sink deeper and deeper into quicksand? Well, Mike, I mean, look look at their three wins, right? I mean, to me, the best win that they got was against the Jacksonville Jaguars at home, okay? But I, the, the win that they got over the Chiefs, it's just one of these weird, weird, weird results that we can look back on and be like, how in the world did that happen? I mean, if Travis Kelsey catches that pass in the end zone, then we're probably having a conversation, and maybe Frank Reck would have been fired a week ago. I don't know. You know, if – um, if Chris Jones doesn't get called for the phantom, uh, you know, taunting the passer or whatever in the world it was that he said that we still don't know, you know, maybe we're having a different conversation because the chiefs can close out that game. I don't know, but I mean, their wins have not been very good. I mean, that Thursday night win that they got over the Broncos was one of the most excruciating football games I have <laughs> ever watched in my life. And I covered an 0-10 Columbia football team. And I'll tell you, man, that was as excruciating a football game as I've ever seen. It was just, it was not watchable. So I think from that standpoint, it's like, yeah, you know, we have three wins, but like, is one of them legit? I don't know. I mean, the Broncos aren't good either. So I, I think that all of those things, you know, as you see them continue to swirl around in Jim Ursay's head, probably it's like, yeah, I don't, I, I can't have this conversation again to, to quote the Sopranos. I did not tweet in real time the question of whether he would hire John Gruden because you persuaded me that not even Jim Ursay would do that. But, Thank you. But I did tweet the question of whether he's actually considering going outside the building for an interim coach because it's been an hour now. And we don't know who the interim coach is. That's a yeah. long time to not it know is. where they're going next. And that leads to another question that we have. And this is a good question and it's pertinent. I've already mentioned his name. This is from James Marvin. What's the legal way for the Colts to get Sean Payton? Now, what they would have to do, because I, I guess they could do it on an interim basis. I was told years ago that if you're going to hire someone from outside the organization, you have to do a search that fully complies with the Rooney rule before you hire someone as an interim coach. And then after this season, you have to do it again, which seems incredibly unwieldy and impractical. I mean, are you going to hire Sean Payton now? And then say, well, we're doing a full-blown search from scratch. I wonder who we're going to hire after this season ends. It just doesn't make any sense. So let's assume they get through the season with an interim coach currently on the staff or somebody who's just a Band-Aid till the end of the year. They yeah. would contact the Saints in theory. This is how it goes in theory. And say, we're interested in hiring Sean Payton. What would the compensation be if we were to hire Sean Payton? They work out a deal. Once they have a deal as to the hypothetical compensation, that's when the Colts have the green light to approach Peyton. Now, now, that's how it works in theory. As a practical matter, the Colts aren't calling the Saints unless they know that Peyton wants the job and they know how much yes. they're going to pay Peyton for that job. You don't just go make this loose, open-ended commitment that somebody would eventually find out about unless you know you're going to get the guy, unless Jim Irsay would do something like that. So legally, they're not supposed to talk to Peyton directly or indirectly. They will, if that's who they want. And by the time they make the call to the Saints, they have a pretty good idea what it's going to take to get him, both as to his salary and as to whatever they have to give the Saints. That's how it would work if they want to do it. And then you give the keys to Peyton, and you let Peyton go. Hey, hey if Peyton's willing to coexist with Jim Irsay, and if he thinks he can find a way to, to work things in a way that gets Irsay to leave him alone, I think the biggest problem with working for Jim Irsay is he's going to show up in your office and want to talk for an hour about nothing. That, that's, that's, I mean, if you've ever, I'm, all due respect, 
if you've ever watched or listened to a Jim Ursay interview, it's like, is there a point here somewhere, Jim? Because we all got other things to do. Can we, can we, can, can we move this along? Kind of like some of you may be feeling right now. So uh, that's how it would work with Sean Payton. And um, hey, if they have a path to the number one pick or a franchise quarterback at the top of the draft, that makes it an attractive position, especially if Ursay is willing to dig deep and pay Sean Payton 20, 25 million a year. Who knows? Right. Well, I mean, isn't that what we said about the Jacksonville Jaguars opening a couple of years ago, right? When they attracted Urban Meyer and it was like, oh man, uh, is this the, is this the guy that's really going to do it? You know, because they've got Trevor Lawrence and they can pick whoever they want and, you know, then you can uh, craft the organization in your image and da, 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 da. So, I mean, yeah, if they end up with the number one overall pick, then that's, you know, something that potentially is attractive. I mean, the other factor in this to me, I mean, we have two known openings right that are uh for head coaches right you've got carolina panthers and then you've got the indianapolis colts if i'm the new orleans saints and i'm going to effectively deal sean payton somewhere it's obviously to indianapolis other than the carolina i'm not doing that with the division rival to me that's still a non-starter i I don't care what the compensation would be like no i'm not allowing him to come into my building every single year and potentially beat me that's not happening you know, you want to, if, if he's in the AFC, fine. You know, we see him once in our building every seven years, eight years, whatever it is, you know, maybe more now that we have this 17th game. And then you see him in the Super Bowl if he happens to be there. So that to me, from the Saints perspective is like, oh, you go on, go coach the, uh, the Colts, go do it. That's fine. And, and really, you know, thinking about Colts and Saints in the Super Bowl, that's what happened to cap the 2009 yes. season. And the Colts were beaten by, Sean Payton. So I don't rule out anything because, you know, anytime I float some crazy theory, I say crazier things have happened. This is a prime example, what we're discussing today, of the crazier things that happen. This is as crazy as it gets. We're an hour removed from the firing of Frank Reich. We have no idea who the interim head coach is going to be. We have no idea who's going to run the offense. We have no idea whether they did this to tank or whether this is some last ditch effort to turn it around. Who's the quarterback going to be? Is it Sam Ellinger? Is it Matt Ryan? Is it Nick Foles? Do they bring back Andrew Luck for crying out loud? I don't know. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. It makes it fun to watch and monitor and cover miles. And unless you have any final thoughts, I'll throw it to you for one last thing. I think we've done all the damage we can in a half hour. One final thought Uh on what we've witnessed so far today. Like I said, I I think Frank Reich is still a good football coach. You know, I I don't know that he is one of those guys in that North Turner, Wade Phillips vein. I still think Wade Phillips kind of gets a bad rap because if you look at his winning percentage, you know, it's not really not that bad, but that's not what we're talking about today. But I think that in theory, you know, Frank Reich could maybe go somewhere else and do a good job. If nothing else, he's going to be a really good offensive coordinator for somebody's team next year. Yeah, that man can coach offense. It just happened that things fell apart in Indianapolis and the way they fell apart after what we saw last season, it just happened really quickly. You know what I would do if I was Jim Irsay? First, I'd call Tony Dungeon and say, can you come back and just help me control this for the rest of the year? Get Help me get this under control. Coach Dungeon won't do it. Bring back Jim Caldwell <laughs> for the rest of the year. I'm serious. I mean, that's, Caldwell, that's Caldwell got caught up in the whole, you know, disaster with Peyton Manning. Hey, when you don't have a backup quarterback because Peyton Manning's threatened by everybody, this is what you get when Peyton Manning's out for the year. You get a complete shit season, and then everybody gets fired when maybe they shouldn't have been. Caldwell was far better than he gets any credit for with Detroit. If the goal Amen. is to just stabilize the franchise, I'd bring big back Jim Caldwell with a very clear understanding that he's in the mix to be the guy beyond this season. That's what I would do if I was Jim Irsay. But again, we are the rash. It's a good idea, Mike. Trying to predict the behaviors of the inherently irrational. And I say that with all due respect and discretion. All right, Miles, thank you so much. After being up at 4 a.m. to do PFT Live, another half hour of PFT PM. And who knows, maybe another edition of PFT PM later today, depending upon the next crazy thing that happens in the NFL. Thanks to all of you for some of your time. We'll talk to you again real soon. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.